Rees shared some of those prejudices. He viewed his subjects as specimens who had to be displayed for the ultimate good of their own class. He didn't ask permission. He burst in in the middle of the night like a cop with a camera. The results are like images of befuddled animals in their den. New York was a city in continuous convulsion, Baghdad on the subway, one writer called it. It was the urban frontier, more real to most Americans than the vanished frontier out west. The painter who led the depiction of this tough, exuberant city was a son of a riverboat gambler who'd killed a man in Nebraska and fled east. His name was Robert Henry. He'd learned about realism at the Philadelphia Academy and in Paris. He was a charismatic teacher and he'd acquired a circle of younger artists who were as committed as he was to painting the human clay, the streets and slums of New York. There is only one reason for art in America, he said, and that is that the people of America learn the means of expressing themselves in their own time and their own land. Because of their desire to tell some truths about the dirty city, Henry's group was nicknamed the Ashcan School. They spurned academic painting. They disliked Impressionism as an art of mere surfaces. Henry wanted art to be akin to journalism. He wanted paint to be as real as mud, as the clods of horseshit and snow that froze on Broadway in the winter as real a human product as sweat, carrying the unsuppressed smell of human life. Idealism he scoffed at. Another colloquial artist was George Bellows. His views of the excavation for Pennsylvania Station show a grand canyon in the city, with late snow still on the floor of the crater. Steam and smoke billow up from the engines below. This is a view of the city as precipitous, dizzying. Forty-two kids depict the pale, gawky, knobbly bodies of working-class boys horsing around by the Hudson River on what was called Splinter Beach, a broken-down wooden pier. But Bellow's fascination with low life and high testosterone found its main subject in the prize fights that were held in semi-clandestine New York clubs with the ferocity of gang warfare. Prize fighting was illegal in New York, but that did nothing to stop it. And for Bellows, as for Hemingway and Norman Mailer later, it was a prime metaphor of manliness and survival, war in a smoky room. In Stag at Sharkey's, the boxers form an arch joined only at their heads. The faces are bloody speed blurs, the pigment fat and vivid, the bodies starkly gleaming. Along the ringside are the heads of the spectators that put you in mind of Daumier. The most lyrical and politically the most acerbic of the Ashcan artists was John Sloan, a spectator of life, as he called himself, looking at a less violent world than Bellows. In election night, he sets down a more benign crowd, a throbbing, chaotic bunch of New Yorkers making whoopee under the elevated railway. Sloan's work had an honest humaneness, a frank sympathy. He refused to flatten lower-class New Yorkers into stereotypes of misery. It is the poor who emigrate, and the poor don't bring Titians with them. But in America, the immigrants created a new popular culture, the folk art of the urban crowd.
Its great instrument was the silent movie, which crossed all the barriers of language and spoke to every level of the American Tower of Babel precisely because it was silent. Its supreme exponent was Charlie Chaplin, an emigrant from the East End of London. Chaplin's tramp enacts the difficulties and humiliations of the immigrant underdog. The constant struggle at the bottom of the American heap. And yet he triumphs over adversity without ever rising to the top, thereby staying in touch with his audience. Chaplin's films were also deliciously subversive. The bumbling officials enable the immigrants to laugh at those they fear. But because silent cinema was entertainment and not art, people didn't resist it. It largely escaped controversy. It changed the perceptions of a whole society, but it was tolerated and welcomed. Painting and sculpture, high art, were a different matter. Not many Americans cared about changes in their language, but those who did care saw modernism as a threat to civilization itself. In art, America really disliked the new, at first. Like cinema, modern art was an immigrant too, and it was treated accordingly. When a conservative critic in New York called cubism and fauvism Ellis Island art, his readers knew exactly what he meant, that it was foreign, incomprehensible, Jewish. Now the taste for modernism developed quite slowly at first, and it was mainly fostered by one man, the son of a wealthy German Jew in New York who ran a tiny gallery at 291 Fifth Avenue and backed the artists who he believed were radicals and risk takers. His name was Alfred Stieglitz. Stieglitz was, as a friend said, the John the Baptist in the desert of American art. His gallery was the first in New York to show Picasso, Cezanne, Matisse, and he fought for early American modernists too. Stieglitz's commitment to modernism laid the ground for the most influential art show ever put on in America. Here in the New York Armory in 1913, modern art became a public issue for the first time in America. The Armory show was put together by a committee of artists and others who wanted to create a sort of giant overview, a manifesto of new art both in Europe and in America. It contained work by Cezanne, Matisse, Gauguin, Van Gogh, Picasso, Brancusi and scores of others and most of the 70,000 New Yorkers who flocked to see it had never been exposed to anything resembling this kind of imagery. They, like the journalists and the critics who wrote about it, were both horrified and vastly amused by the spectacle. And the lesson that most of them took home from the armory was that modern art was weird and foreign and deeply un-American. Cubists are making insanity pay. Kenyon Cox, member of the National Nobody Academy. Nobody who has been drinking should be let in to see this show. It is a disgrace to New York's Mon fine Dieu. Of They have hang him, my masterpiece, upside down. These figures are a useless pastiche. Younger American artists would be far better avoiding these daubs and childish marks. This painting became the star freak of the armory show. It's bearded lady or it's two-headed chicken. People compared it to an explosion in a shingle factory or to an earthquake on the subway. And it is, of course, nude descending a staircase by Marcel Duchamp. A brown painting in a cubist idiom, though, as a matter of record, the cubists themselves didn't like it very much. The fame it has today is the fossil of the enormous notoriety that was dumped on it in 1913 as a puzzle picture. It's gone into the Pantheon because it embodies the idea that the truly new work of art, like a prophet, has to be scorned and stoned by the ignorant mob before ascending into museum heaven. The nude was based in part on the sequential photos studying movement done by the French photographer Marais and the Englishman Edward Mybridge. 
It's no more advanced as such than any other Cubo-Futurist painting, but the media created its fame. But for me, it was a, a great break, of course, from Impressionism and Fauvism and all the movements before. <clears throat> and uh, the painting was shown in New York then in 13, 1913. And that was supposed to be a, a break in my life because it was a succès de scandale and uh, I took advantage of it. Duchamp's effect on the American avant-garde was enormous. Partly it came from his ready-mades, common objects, most notoriously this urinal, which he simply declared to be a work of art and entitled Fountain, flowing in reverse, as it were. <laughs> 